K-12 school teacher. I run an apartment. So I'm going to do what all teachers do at the start. After you've just had lunch, I'm going to have you give a little quiz. All right? Real quick quiz. Everybody take a look. Also, too, I'm walking around. Sorry. Old teaching habit's not going to change now. Look at these two pictures and tell me how they're alike and how they are different. What do you notice in those pictures? All males in the top. There's one. Black and white photography. So, hint, this is the top picture was taken in 1918. This is a class of 2018 current kids. They're smoking then, and they've got baseball caps. I notice we're all drawn up to that old picture, right? Is that a rifle? Yeah, that's a rifle. <laughs> but you know what you have in the bottom you don't have in the top? Teenagers. There was no such thing as a teenager in 1918. Yes, we had teens, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds, but we didn't have teenagers. You know what caused us to have teenagers? The car. See, before that, before the arrival car, you went a courting, literally. Young man fancied a young woman, he would have to walk to her house. The whole family would be there. If that went well, they did it again. And they might do it two or three times. Before maybe you get to walk to town, obviously chaperoned. Car changes that. Car changes, now I can go on a date and I don't need mom and dad there. Also, more importantly, a car means we now can have bigger schools. So now we have, instead of a single school that's got a whole range of age of kids, now we can have a concentration of 115-year-olds, 116-year-olds. And that gave rise by 1940s of the idea of a teenager. All right? Now let's, so it's all, the point of that is it's just our perception of something. Let's go to the next one here. All right, let's look in the left and right of this. What do we got over here on the left side? Girls were in school out in the field working. All right, now on the right side, we've got kids working in the classroom. Raise your hand if you've told your own children, your students, or a family member, your job as a student is, your job is being a student. Today, that's what we say. You don't have to worry about anything else. Your, mom, you know, your family's working hard for you, so you can be a student. So 100 years ago, we had 8% of the kids, this ties in what I guess we are talking about earlier today, 8% of the kids graduated from secondary school. Today, it's something like 80%. But again, it's our perception. We also have this notion right now that adolescence has now been pushed down to 10 because of better eating and stuff. We start puberty earlier, and it goes up to 24. You worry, though, sometimes if all your job is is studying and we think you're a kid, we're not going to give you responsibilities that just 100 years ago we had no problem giving to you. At 17, you could be married, running a farm with two kids. Does that make sense? So that's the point of this. As our talk, we're going to talk about all these new tools coming and just giving these students recognizing they're capable of doing lots of things that maybe we don't automatically think of. All right, we're Charlotte Latin School. We're a K-12 school. Um, it's a prep school. I work with the public schools in Charlotte Mecklenburg for years. Been as a side note, I've won teaching awards at Charlotte Latin while at Charlotte Latin. That's how much involvement we're with the public schools. I'm also involved with the science. Uh, house, which is a best practices in North Carolina, involved with some programs that are used around the nation. So what I'm going to share with you today and what Maxine is joining us today can be anywhere. In fact, we were at Dripping Springs yesterday. I visited their fab lab. They're doing a tremendous job out there. Okay. I started teaching engineering at Charlotte Lanton. I've been there 28 years, uh, excuse me, 31 years. We started teaching this 29 years ago. Back in 1989, we started teaching engineering. We talk about STEM, and I want to really address this part. We've been teaching science and math and technology, computer science. So it was the engineering method we started bringing in with STEM. But from our, and at least at our school, our philosophy was you're still going to keep learning math. You're still teaching science. We're adding this on there, and we're complementing it. I can tell you from, and we do a lot of programming. You can't do teach engineering and not teach programming right now. So, what I can tell you off of this, no one has ever walked out of the engineering class and asked us why they needed math. Also, too, I don't know if we were talking about perceptions and getting girls in computer science and math. We really have to also include our parents in here and them doing things they don't even realize. I mentioned this earlier. How many teachers does it drive you crazy? Because I've had, especially when I was teaching middle school, parents. Moms are very intelligent women say to their seventh grade daughter, 
don't worry, honey, I couldn't do math either. How in the world do you expect any child to take math if the parent immediately says, I can't do it, neither of you have to worry about it? All right, we are a fab lab, and I'll explain a little bit more about what a fab lab is. It was, as, as a speaker, earlier speaker mentioned, Neil Gershenfield from MIT started a class, How to Make Almost Anything. He, the first time he offered it, he thought he'd get 15 engineering graduate students. And he thought, well, this would be such a great class. It won't be a big class, but we have all this desktop manufacturing. It's getting unaffordable. We can make 95% of almost anything with this. He started it. He got a response. 300 people signed up for the class. The best part of it was it was art students. It was philosophy students. It was music students. It wasn't just engineers. So the class is very popular, and you see, jumped in the wild, as they say, is now across the world, more than 1,000 fab labs in the world. I think I was in a conference in France, there's 1,400 fab labs. Europe's really embraced this a lot. We're, we happen to be a K-12 fab lab. We're a fab, we also are trained. We've gone through Fab Academy. We're also what's called a node. We train other teachers and other adults to do this. But in a fab lab, you'll see up there, it's a lot of digital design, a lot of programming, a lot of, um, and then manufacturing processes. Here's the analogy I use. I'm right now teaching electronics to my students. And I tell them, I'm teaching your magic. No, yeah. All right, now I'll know the quote. Yeah, technology sufficiently advanced appears to be magic. But my point to them is, can you see electricity? No, but it does all these incredible things. Right now, let me ask you this question. If your phone went off right now, you got a phone, one of these phones, everybody in here does. Pull your phone out if right now you can tell me what a phone is, how it works. Anybody got a phone out? You all are super intelligent people in this room. I know I'm the slow kid in this class. Let me explain. We're dependent on this technology. Doesn't that make you nervous? So when I talk to kids about magic and electricity, what I'm saying is you can't see it, you can't touch it, we can just vet, measure it. And just like in Harry Potter books, it's hard to learn. So electricity is hard. One thing I will say in STEM, we embrace the difficulty. Now, I have to get them engaged. It's got to be interesting. Maxine isn't going to waste part of her day if she doesn't get to work on something that's going to interest her. Mine is a hard elective. But just like who of all the um, divisions of the military, and we're certainly not a division of the military, which division had the hardest time recruiting during the Gulf Wars, the Iraq Wars. Which division never had a problem? They always met their numbers. United States Marine Corps, folks, because they told you what they were. They said, this is what we are. If you're part of the warrior class, come see if you can be one of us. Now, I'm not saying we do engineering, we only say, oh, the cardinals, our best students should study engineering. Absolutely not. Some of the kids there that are struggling love this stuff and will jump on it. All right, so what we want to do though, I just, I'm adding some features that have come up through the day. We have found in ours that you embrace it's challenging and then there's a little bit of esprit de corps. All right, so right there, that's the sex, one of the sexy machines in modern prototyping and making a 3D printer. You have laser cutter CNC machines. I show you because the price of those have dropped. They used to be $4,000. You can build one yourself for $300. So this equipment is available to everybody. This ability to do magic is there in terms of hardware. So what's the next thing we need to do? We need a process that teaches them how to solve a problem, how to create something. We also need to make sure we're teaching the math and science that goes with it. Someone else I spoke to today, Mary there, we were talking about, hey, we're doing STEM and a lot of these kids aren't getting the science or the math they need. We gotta be careful about that. I agree completely with her. You need to make sure you're doing the math and science behind it. That's why I suggest as an elective, it shouldn't replace things. Because this motivates you. Again, no one asked me in my class, why do I have to do this math? They understand they're using the math like a tool. But for those, just real quick, difference between the engineering method and the scientific method is, scientific method, we're trying to, get, we're trying to find an unknown. We just want to be sure. We as scientists are very care careful about saying, this is true drives the rest of the world nuts because scientists don't want to say, we know this for a fact, because we're always nervous. All you need is one experiment to prove us wrong, and oh no. Engineering's the opposite of, 
We're trying to improve something, so we're going to keep improving it. We're going to keep reiterating it, reiterating it, reiterating. Where science, you'd want to do the same thing. So you show them the difference. So that's perfect for that kid that says, or gal that says, I want to be an inventor. This is that. I want to know why a star is blue. That's more the scientific method. So we've showed them two things in their toolbox, their superpowers toolbox, that are available to, any, to most every school. We have the supportive industry that loves, honestly, um, supporting where the skills are needed. So you can get funding. The third thing is how are you going to evaluate them? So if you look up there, this is a, we use digital portfolios. We think that's a more accurate way to measure when kids are doing this kind of learning. You can see a complete process of what's going on. If you go to Maxine's page down the road, it's going to show you how she did it, how much soft, what software she did, what, were her, what things went well, what things didn't go well. And she can you can repeat her work. So it gives you a very clear idea of what's going on there. This happens to be Evans. And, he's, and you can see the art. Also in a fab lab, we have our art departments right across from the fab lab, and our kids use it. We use the fab lab. I mean, once you get trained, you can do it. Anybody can use this stuff. So you have three tools that kids know how to do. These young ladies, so if you've got this fab lab, and you're right earlier about how do you tie this in with schools. So here's two of the ways we're doing it at our school. And so really I'm talking to it just in my school. Uh, by the way, the digital portfolio, colleges are now wanting to see digital portfolios in engineering. They want to see, that. did you do the math behind it? Did you do the science? Do you understand what you really did? Um, these young ladies did the cyber mission program, and that's a competition. So e-cyber. So they were at, at the national level with that right now. I assure, let me ask you, on a project like that, so eCyber, what theirs was is they decided, they, they figured you have all these people sitting in a football stadium, and if you move a magnet up and down a coil of wire, you're going to start to produce energy. Well, how much energy could you produce? And they investigated that. Ask yourself this question. Of all the things you did in school, do you remember that social studies project where you made the state of Texas or whatever thing that you really interested, whatever it was, or do you remember the last chemistry test you ever took? It's got to be relevant. The kids pick that up very quickly. In our program, they spend the first marking period learning the science and math and the engineering skills we want. In the second mar mar program, they begin to work on a project that means something to them. All right. In terms from it, we also at our school, and you're seeing this at more and more schools, entrepreneurial programs. Please tie your entrepreneurial programs in with STEM. And I know we call it STEM, then we added art, so we call it STEAM, then we added entrepreneurial programs, and now it's E-STEAM or something, depending on what school you're in. All right? The gentleman on the la left, uh, Jack there, in the center of the two adults, won the Blue Diamond Technology Award in the city of Charlotte. He developed a project in our fab lab, a box that used Bluetooth that turned and controlled all the lights on on trucks. You know how 17, 18 year old guys buy the trucks, they put all the lights on them and they want to control them. They usually just use switches to turn them on and off. He didn't want to do that. So he built his own electronic device to do it. It's now being manufactured in South Carolina. He set up the whole business that way. So that's where your entrepreneurial program. He was in my entrepreneurial class using the Fab Lab and he came up with that business that's a viable business right now. The young lady on the right is Olivia. And Olivia is um, working this summer on back braces for people with spinal problems. And that was done with a 3D printer. So that's the new technology on that. She's looking at commercializing that. Not all of them are going to be commercialized, but they have these problems. Uh, these problems, so they work on a project that they're interested in after you have it. Now, do you, again, I, I just want to restate, you have the math and your science. This really does complement. This is your elective for that class. All right. Maxine, you want to take it away? My name is Maxine Tan. I'm a junior in high school. I attend Charlotte Latin School, and I also use the Fab Lab there. Um, 
And I moved to Charlotte Latin as a sophomore. So I entered into this engineering program with no experience in STEM whatsoever. I think I took some architectural class freshman year, but I really had no experience in STEM. And then I joined this intro class to engineering and I felt overwhelmed at first because all of these kids had been doing engineering using the fab lab since they were in middle school. And then I was just thrown into the middle of this laser cut Fusion 360 3D printing world, and I was really struggling. But then I realized after maybe a week, I loved it. I loved being able to use these materials, use these machines, and make whatever I wanted. Um, so really, I realized that not that STEM isn't hard, just anyone can do it as long as we're given the materials to do so. So with the Fab Lab, everyone at Charlotte Latin has access to it. Mr. Dubik on Tuesday nights, keeps the Fab Lab open until seven, so people, if they want to, um, students, even parents of kids at Charlotte Latin, they can go in, make whatever they want, as long as they know how to use the, use the, the um, machines. And I think this is really just a great opportunity for everyone um, to use, to do whatever they want. So in my intro class, we learned the basics of engineering. We learned how to use the machines, like CNC machines, 3D printers, laser cutters, stuff like that and as well as um, basic HTML. We um, learned a bit of coding with Arduino. So you see my um, Arduino board there where we coded LEDs, lights. Um, and we also learned how to do a little um, woodworking, as you see there as well. And we learned how to do, use free Fusion 360, which was actually immensely helpful because, so first of all, we did a unit on 3D printing and then we used Fusion 360 there. But when I went to a engineering program at Columbia, they had a makerspace, and I thought it was really cool that I knew exactly how to use F Fusion 360, which they were teaching the other kids how to use. So when the teacher was occupied with some other people and my friends were trying to figure out how to use Fusion 360 because they wanted to print something, I knew exactly what to do. It, these things have, um, have applications outside of my own fab lab. I can do these things side of my fab lab and I can actually, it's not just for school. A lot of the time you learn things in school and you walk out and you're like, I'm never gonna use this ever in my life. But this, this that's not true here. I went to Columbia, I used that there and I helped other people. Same with Arduino. It's used by a lot of high school students as an intro to robotics and stuff like that. So at my, um, thing in Columbia, I wasn't part of the robotics class, but I had a robotics friends and they didn't know how to co code with Arduino. And I was actually able to help them like, oh, you're missing a semicolon here, whatever basic things, just because I'd been introduced to them already. And it's really not that difficult, but people just have to be exposed to these um, tools that they can use in the future. So what I did for my personal project was I created a, I'm a figure skater, right? And that's a huge part of my life. So I used what I know from my intro en engineering class to create a vest that measures how fast you rotate, and that's very important for figure skaters, and it sends that data to your phone over Bluetooth. So I don't expect anyone here to know a lot about figure skating, just to put it in perspective. So this is a single sow a double sow and a triple sow. So that was a single. This is a type of jump. And this is just to help you picture the difference in rotation speed to show how important rotation is to figure skaters. So when you're learning jumps in figure skating, the tiniest thing can mean the difference between a clean jump, a fully rotated jump, or a cheated jump, one that is lacking rotation. So when you're with your coach, when you're working on your jumps, it's all these little details, all these little corrections can eventually lead to a clean jump. So, for example, if I have a good air position, in the, I have a good tight air position, which is necessary to rotate fast, um, then if my jump is still cheated when I'm doing that, maybe we need to change my arm position. So, in those videos, my arms were like this, right? But there's also this different technique of the seatbelt position like this, where that's a different air position. And so in figure skating, you can use these tiny corrections to see if those corrections can lead you to a better jump. So 
connecting this back to my project, you can see that you can do a jump first with this air position and record it with my vest and look at the highest rate of rotation and see what that is. And then later compare it to the new air position and see how, that, how fast that is. So really, you can use this as a training tool to see if corrections that your coach gives you or even corrections that you make yourself to see if those are actually helpful and they improve your jump or if they don't really do anything or sometimes they make it worse, you see that instantly. And yes, although now there are people um, record videos of themselves to see, this is such a, like a jump, it's less than 0.5 seconds. Like there's no way you're gonna get fast, um, more airtime than 0.5 seconds. And can we really detect the smallest changes within 0.5 seconds? So I think this helps with numerical values, um, seeing what is better or what isn't better. This is um, a video of my values coming in as I do a jump as well. Yeah, I fell. Um, but I did cho choose that one for a specific reason. Okay, so this I went through and I found the fastest value that I had. So 286 degrees per second. And this is the fastest value and this is what you would normally um, compare with other jumps if I were comparing jumps between myself and another jump, right? Um, so you can see that I have a tight air position. My legs are in tight, my arms are in tight, and I'm vertical in the air, which is critical for fast rotation. Then, as I'm starting to come out of the jump, my rotation slows down to 103 degrees per second. And you can see that because my left leg is starting to come out, my, my feet aren't together anymore. And then finally, where I fall, 202 degrees per second. And I thought this was important to include because when we're falling, you don't think about the forces that you undergo when you fall. But really, you're it's like splaying out to the side and that, that can't be good for your body. So you see, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see the um, how fast you're rotating, 202 degrees per second, which is faster than the previous slide. Um, so this shows how much forces we're going under. So I actually have back problems. I've had like three separate back problems, two separate knee problems, ankles, shins, you name it, I've had it. And this is very, um, this is a common thing amongst figure skaters, and I think I didn't even notice that this vest could measure this, but it shows us how much force that our body is undergoing when we're falling and training. And of course you don't wanna fall when you're training, but it happens, it's part of the learning curve. And so I think this helps us visualize and understand how we need to limit how many jumps we're doing, um, limit our training as well, so not do like five hours a day, that's just not gonna be healthy for you. Um, so you can really understand what this sport is doing to you and also how you need to limit that and understand what you're going to do with this information. So at the end of this, I realized that if I never moved to Charlotte and discovered this fab lab and used all of it, what, has, what it has to offer, I never would have made this vest, never would have understood really what we're going through when we're in the air. And just I'm thankful for this opportunity that the fab lab has given me and now I really love engineering. I know I want to pursue it as a major and as my career. And it just wouldn't have been possible without the materials and um, resources that we have at the Fab Lab. So thank you. Thank you.